So I'll be uh, monitoring um, the text here. Maybe we'll put some stuff in public chat, maybe not. Um, and Serge, our wonderful volunteer facilitator, will nudge me as needed and help people if you're having any trouble. Um, but I'll be answering questions all along the way. And if you have questions while I'm doing stuff, please ask them and I'll, I'll um, try to um, answer them as we go along. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that, um, um, as some t-shirts say, you probably only want to touch certain parts of the soldering iron, but that's pretty obvious. And um, let me grab my soldering stuff. So most of you do not have an argue touch kit, but um, I'm going to show you how to solder using an argue touch kit. And um, but first, I got to upload my slides. Oh, um, Serge, can you make me a presenter so I can do that stuff? I will do I that. Will do that. Right. My name is Serge. Serge. Thank you. Uh, presenter. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for mispronouncing your name so often. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, upload presentation. <clears throat> Great. So here's a soldering iron. I'm going to plug it in. If you have one and want to follow along as we're doing it, feel free to do that too. Also um, here, here, let me do the, um, the video here. If you look above, um, you can see my face and you can also see another video, Mitch Phone 2, um, which is showing my uh, work area here. Get some more light on this um, here. So um, you can see the soldering iron. Um, don't absolutely need a stand, but it's kind of nice. My stand I made out of um, a wire coat hanger. I just bent it so that it makes it less likely that the soldering iron can roll and perhaps land on my lap, which I usually do not enjoy. Um, and then I've got a coil of some solder and a wire cutter, small wire cutter is a wet kitchen sponge. If you're, um, there's two kinds of kitchen sponges, one made out of cellulose, which is plant material, and another made out of um, plastic. You want uh, one you know, about the size, doesn't matter how big it is, um, made out of cellulose, not plastic, because the plastic will melt. And this is wet with just wet water, enough so that water will actually drip out of it. Okay, and those are all the tools you need to solder. This soldering iron um, cost me uh, 10 euros. You can buy ones, like I, I have some on my website. Uh, right now I'm between fulfillment centers, but normally I have them on my website with everything you need for 20 bucks. Um, but you can look online and uh, find them on AliExpress and all sorts of places for, um, um, anything from uh, a couple dollars, uh, you know, it costs you probably about the same uh, 15, 20 dollars to get everything you need and um, uh, all the way up to fancy stations and um, uh, you don't need anything fancy though. Like I said, this cost me 10 euros. Um, you can get wire cutters that are like two dollars, sponges are like 10 cents. The solder is a, a roll big roll of solder that's totally full is like 35. You can get a, a shorter roll that's more like, um, you know, five to $10, 10 euros, whatever. Um, and I'll show you the kind of solder to buy. Um, I have my preferences, other people have their preferences, but I'll show you what I like. Okay, so, um, hmm, my big blue button screen went blank. That's kind of a bummer. Um, 
Let me try start sharing. And there I am again. So um, let's see, everyone can hear me? Yeah, good. Um, and now let's see, did the thing upload? Oh, no, it's working. It's just taking its time doing slides. <clears throat> I've got 162 slides. It's up to 109 now. So um, while it's doing that, let me show you um, what, um, what we got here. So this there's lots and lots and lots of cool things you can buy online. This is one thing I think is cool. That's why I made it. Um, it's uh, RG Touch Music Synthesizer Kit. Oh, it's uploaded. There we go. Confirm. There it is. Okay, cool. There's my contact info. Feel free to contact me anytime for any reason, as always. Um, and um, this kit I made, I've um, uh, been working on it for like five years now, and it's pretty mature. It's got all sorts of amazing synthesizer uh, sounds that you can program into it with uh, the free Arduino programming environment and all my code and hardware, everything, like everything I do is open source. And um, uh, the Arduino library and sketches for all the synthesizers, they work on any Arduino. Um, the only thing different with my board, here's a board, um, is that it has pads for the keys, but you can just have wires going to an Arduino to a piece of metal. Um, it has a, um, um, audio amplifier. It's not a very good one with a speaker, but it's enough so that after you solder it together, you know it works. It has uh, a couple of controls here, twiddle knobs, and a couple of buttons and some LEDs for giving some feedback. Um, but you can add all of that to any Arduino board. Um, but just as an example of things, I've got a bunch here. I've got way more now. Um, I only have seven of these soldered up now, um, but here's here's the one it comes with when you uh, get the the um, uh, the kit. And it has a couple different sounds. So that, that one's called Thick, and it's saw wave, Sawtooth Waves. Um, here's another one which is, and they're all way different. This one uh, is called Arpology. And I can make arpeggios with this one. And you can tell it to play itself. You can make it minor or major. It has a bunch of cool presets. and. It never repeats. It does Bach like arpeggios. I'm into Bach. I'm also into um, crazy noise. This one is called Zoid. Um, and this one, you can turn the knobs, you get even crazier noises. And uh, this one makes drones. So has lots of presets. Here's one with um, sort of like a, a delay loop um, where you can add lots of sounds. And it fades out. You can also set it up so that it mucks with the sound as you do it. Um, here's another one. Um, this one does some cool like Indian sort of scales. Whatever, I got I got a drum machine. <laughs> Here's a drum machine. Plays 
bass on top of it. Um, so those are the ones I have just here demoing. <laughs> and I have a video online of me playing all seven at once, um, which is kind of fun. So back to doing this stuff. Get rid of that noise so you can hear me. Yeah, let's get going. Um, it's my contact info. Um, so what, what do people think? I could um, uh, install a switch that lets you choose. Uh, right now, I don't do that. The um, I'm using the cheapest Arduino possible as the base of it, which is Arduino Uno. And it only has so many pins available. And I use all of them for the touch keyboard and the amp and all that stuff. So um, you can hack on it, or you can do the same code and hack on it on a, the equivalent, like an Arduino Mega, which I'm, I'm doing some cool things with that now, but it's not ready for like sharing. Uh, I've been so busy with German lessons and organizing for hope and whatever, uh, and the pandemic and supporting people. And But it'll happen. Um, yeah, and we want to have it with MIDI and other stuff too. And that won't be a kit. That will be um, uh, hackable with the Arduino software, though. And it's it's some cool stuff happening. But it, it's not in a state where I can share it. Sorry. It's just craziness. Um, but within the, within the, um, by fall, I'll be I'll be sharing that on my GitHub. And I have the link for the GitHub on my um, on my screen here. Craziness is good. Yes. Sanity is only takes you so far. <laughs> um, so um, uh, the, um, yeah, there's like just a photo I took. Um, and I made this so people could learn to solder and learn to make sound with microcontrollers and learn the basics of dig digital signal processing, which um, is, is really complicated. But to learn the basics when presented the right way really is not all that um, difficult. And um, you know, like to learn the basics is, is actually pretty fun. So um, I don't know. Do do people? I have some slides at the beginning before I show how to solder. Uh, uh, just a bit about how the um, digital signal processing works. Is that something people are into, or or is soldering more the thing right now? Yes, for DSP. Um, Open source theremin, yeah. There's some really, there's a bunch of cool open source theremins. Um, there's so many cool open source projects, and then there's some projects which are also really cool but aren't open source. Like uh, Mozi is amazing, which I found after I started doing this, and and Mozi's been around for even longer. Um, but it's not totally open source. Um, um, but still, you can look at their code and learn from it. I'll show you my uh, GitHub. It's totally open source. Do whatever that you want with it and ask me questions if you like to. Me and my friend Bill work on this together. And my friend Bill um, was one of the people who, who, along with me and Jaron Lanier, way back in the 80s, created virtual reality by accident. Um, so um, uh, he's amazing. And we're both ha happy to answer questions if you have any. So, um, OK, so I'll go over quickly a bit of the basics of DSP. Um, but first, just a bit about synthesis in general. So um, um, let's see, I'll put my phone down for now because I don't need that. It'll just be black for now. Um, so between uh, the shared slide and my, my beautiful face. So um, um, modular synthesis has been around for a long time. Uh, one of the people who made it super popular and easy to use, relatively easy to use anyways, way easier than before, was Robert Moog which, with his um, synthesizers, and in particular the Mini Moog way back when. You have a few waveforms, um, just really basic waveforms, and you can do muck with them and add them together and, and have them interact in all sorts of ways and um, make all sorts of super interesting sounds and music. So this sine wave um, is, is like a pure waveform. And sometimes that's really nice. Other times it's kind of boring, but it's the basis of lots of synthesis. A square wave is usually kind of harsh. It's really scratchy sounding. 
Um, but again, there's time, there's places for it, and there's also places for it for controlling things along with the sine wave. Triangle wave is just a little bit more uh, edgy, just a little bit more edgy than a sine wave. Um, and then a sawtooth wave, that was the first one I played for you, uh, that the, the, the kit comes pre-programmed with, and that's what works uh, as soon as you solder it together or download it online, make it work on your own Arduino. So, um, but with these just four waveforms, you can do lots of amazingly cool things and muck around with it. And then you take these basic waveforms and then you can feed them into filters. And uh, you can have analog uh, or digital with all of these things. Uh, my thing uses a microcontroller, so it's all digital, but I make use of digital models of analog stuff. Um, so it's good to know about the analog. And then um, um, with, with digital, though, you've got only on and off. You don't have all the in-betweens. Like, let me go back to that slide with the, this is a smooth waveform. There's no disconnects. It's not little points. Um, with digital, you have to break it up into lots of little points, each of which is just on and off. Um, so you break it up into all these little bits, then you can mess with it and you put it back together so you get something that you can hear in our actual world. And this is what digital signal processing is all about. And I'm, I'm focusing here just on generating sound. So here's an analog waveform. It's totally smooth, um, no jaggedy edges. This is just a pure sine wave. How do I uh, deal with this in a digital world? Well, I break it up into slices, usually many, many more slices than this, but just to keep it simple, I have these regular intervals where I um, uh, break up the sine wave into um, slices. And the more the better, as I said, and I'll show you why in a bit. Um, so where the vertical lines intersect the waveform is a value. And you can, you can plot those points and enter them into memory, those values into memory. And that's the way that you um, record an analog signal into the digital world, into memory. And the process of doing that is called digital to analog conversion. Um, just kind of whipping through these slides. There's not a whole lot of extra information there. Um, yeah, so you can see it doesn't have to be a sine wave. It can be any shape waveform, and it doesn't have to be just one cycle. It can be lots of cycles. Um, but again, it's just slicing up the waveform and taking the values and putting it in memory. And that's digital to analog, uh, analog to digital conversion, I'm sorry. Um, and what goes on in this box, um, you can do it in a grungy way or in super sophisticated ways, and of course, it costs more or less money to do that or to buy the chips that do that in fancy ways. But you can do that in, in pretty simple ways. And microcontrollers now have, um, even the cheap ones, the cheapest Arduino has an analog to digital converter built in, which is OK enough to do a lot of what you want to do. So how about going the other way? Um, you want to have these values in memory. Once they're in memory, though, you can muck with it. You can do uh, the equivalent of filtering uh, in a digital realm, and that's what it's called, digital filtering. You can get rid of all the higher parts. You can, um, you can add distortion. You can uh, filter just for the mid-range, and you can make it go back and forth, and that can sound like phasers and all sorts of really cool mucking around. Um, once you do that, you have to get it back into the analog world so from the values in your computer memory through the d2a converter digital to analog converter back into a real waveform which you can play through an amp into a speaker or whatever so what goes on in this is also can be really janky or it can be super sophisticated and the way i do it in um the Arju touch uh project is a way that's super simple and it's free because you don't need any extra hardware at all, except for a one resistor and one capacitor per channel. And our new touch has is stereo. It's got two outputs. And each output can have many voices. So there's actually several of these 
um, tables in memory with values that are constantly fluctuating um, in real time fed to either the left D to A converter or the right. And that goes uh, into a, a waveform, which can go into your amplifier. So that's, that's pretty much uh, the basics. So to show you how I do the digital to analog conversion, um, well, the expensive way is to buy a chip, which does it in super amazingly wonderful ways. Um, but um, uh, I can do it in a, a the way that's free, like I told you, and that's called PWM, pulse width modulation. So here's a square wave. It's a bunch of pulses, but the pulses are all square, the same on and off times. On for this long, off for that long, and it just repeats forever that way. That's square. I can make the pulses bigger and smaller. Um, right? So, um, yeah, and, uh, to mention that first, uh, a square wave, if I, um, for instance, if I play that square wave into um, an LED, here is an LED. If I used, um, oops, where's my camera? There it is. Here's an LED. If I played that square wave into an LED, the LED would be on for half the time and off for half the time. And so what it would appear to be to your eyeball would be half brightness. If I play it really, really slow on for a second, off for a second, it looks like it's blinking. But if I do this at a thousand times a second, that's faster than our eyeballs can um, react. So it, we just get sort of an average. And with a square wave on half the time, off half the time, it would appear to be about half brightness. Uh, question, uh, would it be possible to put something like a shift register? Let's not get into super um, uh, uh, more complicated things. I want to get give people a feel right now for how this stuff works. But if you have questions later after the workshop on stuff like this, Chris, please ask me because I'm happy to talk about what I know. And there's a lot that I don't know too, but I'm happy to share what I do know. Um, so um, yeah, so we can vary the widths of these pulses so it's not just on half the time and off half the time. Like here's a pulse waveform, sort of like a square wave, except it's on for a quarter of the time and off for three fourths of the time. And in this case, if I played that into the same LED, it would look like the LED is only on for a quarter brightness to our eyeballs if it's going fast enough. And I can have uh, the pulse be any width I want. And it doesn't have to be quarters and, and even did, uh, integer ratios. It can be anything. Uh, and the ratios can be any um, real number. And those can be changing in real time. So I have off time and on time that's changing. And if it's doing it sinusoidally, that's the way I can make an LED. If it's played into an LED, I can make the LED fade in and out so sinusoidally. But if I do it at a thousand times a second, now I have a thousand kilohertz sine wave that I can play into an amplifier into a speaker and I get a thousand kilohertz sine wave note coming out. And if I do it for other more complicated waveforms, I can make any waveform I want. And that can be calculated uh, in real time with the microcontroller. It can be values stored in a table that's called wavetable. Um, it generated is the first one uh, calculated on the fly. I can take a bunch of sine waves and other waveforms and add them together to get complex waveforms. That's additive synthesis. There's also subtractive. There's also FM, which takes um, a sine wave that's not constant, like one kilohertz all the time. It can be shifting back and forth between one kilohertz and um, uh, like um, a, a thousand. Uh, 500 hertz, and I can have it be shifting back and forth triangularly or sawtooth or other things, and that makes super crazy uh, sounds, um, uh, and that's called FM synthesis, frequency modulated, because um, I'm modulating the frequency over time. Modulating means changing um, over time, so I'm changing the frequency over time, modulating the frequency over time. And uh, the old Yamaha DX7 was the first popular one to do that. And with that, you could get bells and trumpets and all sorts of really cool sounds that were really great for their day back in the 80s. 
Um, but we can do so much more now with the powerful microcontrollers we have, and even the cheapest Arduino can do amazing things. So anyways, that's the way I do the DDA conversion um, in uh, RGTouch, just with this simple free method that just comes <laughs> with the computing power of um, the processor. Um, the thing is, when you, when you uh, and, and when I do that, um, uh, the generation of the sound I call an oscillator. That's, uh, that's what, what's called an oscillator in um, uh, synthesis, music synthesis, sound synthesis. And that is, has no dynamics. So even if it's a complex waveform, it sounds kind of boring um, unless you add dynamics to it. And the dynamics can be all sorts of different things. Um, it can be a, a low pass filter that changes over time. It can be, um, uh, like I said before, a phaser, which is a, a band pass filter that just takes the middle range, but you change the frequency range and go back and forth. And then it sounds like, and uh, you can have the amplitude change quickly over time, um, which is um, uh, trem tremolo. And so, uh, people often, singers often do that with their voice to hide the imperfections or just for cool effects. Um, uh, 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 I'm not a good singer, but uh, uh, that's, that's tremolo. And you can get that effect also from a rotating speaker called a Leslie back in the day. Because um, when the speaker's pointing away, it sounds um, softer. But it's all, this rotating speaker is also adding frequency shifts and other weird things too. Um, and you can have the uh, frequency shifting over time quickly or slowly, and that's vibrato. The Leslie actually mixes tremolo and vibrato. Uh, and vibrato is when, a, um, for instance, a singer is um, fluctuating the frequency of their voice as they're singing. Um, bad example of vibrato for me. So, um, yeah, and you mix all these different dynamics all together all at once, and then you get super interesting sounds. And that's what Robert Moog did with his synthesizers um, and made it really simple with uh, Mini Moog way, way back in the uh, late 60s. Um, we can do that way more now, uh, easier. Um, um, generate this more easily with uh, super inexpensive but powerful microcontrollers, just like the cheapest Arduino, like RGTouch. So the oscillators can be a sine wave, the square wave, the triangle wave, the sawtooth, and many, many other things. Um, yeah, and dynamics, I said a few of them. One of the more important ones is one on the top, ADSR, that's the envelope. Attack, decay, sustain, release. Like when you play a note on a real piano, you press the, the, the key, it doesn't just instantly turn the sound on and it stays level all the way until you let go and then it's instantly off. Um, is someone not seeing my screen? Can everyone see both my video and my slides? Okay, yeah, so sometimes if your internet is slow, it can take a while for things to catch up. You can try doing a refresh and then we'll ha probably have to let you back into the room, but if it's not working, you can try that. Um, and, and then uh, Serge can help or... Um, so anyways, uh, like a piano, you don't press the key and it goes, ah! There's an envelope, it's called an envelope, so the sound quickly gets high and then fades away slowly, and then when you let go of the key, then it fades out more quickly. So the fading in quickly, that's the attack. The slowly decaying, as long as you're pressing the button, is decay, and then it reaches a certain level and sort of stays sustained there for a while until you let go, you release the key, and then it fades out quickly. So you get so attack, decay, sustain, release uh, is really, really common for um, pretty much all synthesizers nowadays and all sorts of other uh, effects. So 
And that's what makes us sound interesting. And that's what we do with um, the firmware for um, the sketches, as they call it, in Arduino land for um, RD Touch. And I already went through that. So flip through those. Um, one thing also with the Arduino Touch library. Um, there's a lot of examples with documentation so that you can start making your own synthesizer sketches um, using all of the super sophisticated um, low level functions that we created that are easy to use, uh, relatively easy to use. And we've got like uh, zillions of examples uh, that when you do them in order, create a tutorial. And um, if you want to do that, that's not required for using RD Touch. You can just solder it together or use your own Arduino and program it, and it'll do the, um, the sketch of your choice. Um, and we've got 10 of those now with very different um, sounds, some of which I demoed for you at the beginning. And, um, 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 and if you do the kit and you solder it together, it's just the thick one with the sawtooth waves, four sawtooth waves added together. Um, but if you want to program other ones in, you can, um, just using the Arduino environment. I'll show how to do that at the end of the workshop. And um, if you want to make your own synthesizers, you can do the tutorial. And, of course, you can ask me and or Bill, my friend, uh, questions along the way if you have them uh, through email. And uh, we're happy to help. So, um, yeah, and along the way, you can learn more about digital signal processing, because that's documented here, too. And I want to add more of that as I have time as well, assuming I ever do. So um, yeah, um, here's, um, let's see, you know, there's all those 40 examples for tutorials. Um, um, it's really easy to make a, um, a um, uh, a synthesizer with uh, the library that we have. It's just a few. And um, I'm not going to go into the details of that right now, but like um, here's um, here's one. <laughs> Can I make that? Let's see, where's my. Yeah, the, the text is kind of small here, so it's hard to read, but it's just a few lines of code to do the very basics. Of, um, of a synthesizer. Here's one that does sawtooth waves, playing with the keyboard. It'll allow you to press buttons to change octaves, and it'll allow one of the, the knobs to be a volume control. And this is the complete program here, just using the functions that we have in the library. And that's one of the examples in the uh, examples when you download. Um, and then it's easy to add from here, from our functions, uh, any of these effects as well. Tremolo, portamento, vibrato, same thing, uh, envelopes, ADSR, et cetera. So all of this is on my GitHub, and you can go there and download it. My GitHub's Maltman23. The slides are not on my GitHub, but um, um, I'll make them available. Actually, let me make them available now. Um, by clicking that button. OK, so I believe that allows any one of you to download my slides. And uh, what do you do, like right click on it or click on it? I'm actually not sure. I've never done that. Um, but if that's problematic, uh, just email me, and I will send you a link where you can download it. Oh, see it lower left. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, maybe the blue circle with the plus sign. Yeah, downloading. Great. So that works. So um, cool technology. 21st century is so awesome. Um, yeah, so um, I've given these slides are actually from um, when I've done this workshop uh, live. And we have tools um, and then asking people not to bring them home. But this is all you need. And I already showed those uh, inexpensive tools. Um, and I'm going to show you how to solder. Um, let me get this on uh, here. Move this over to where you can see. OK. 
Okay, so um, is that working? Yeah, so this is where I'm going to solder. I'll go through some pictures first, and then I'll uh, actually solder. And hopefully, I've never done this virtually before, so let's see how this works. <laughs> None of us have done this virtually before. We're all making this up as we go along, right? So, um, um, but let's see how this works. So here's my kit. Um, it's got um, a URL to the assembly instructions, which will be on, on these slides here as well. Um, but the kit comes with a board, which I designed. Here's the back of the board, the front of the board. Um, so here, let's see. Um, here you can see um, these, this is the touch keyboard. The uh, Arduino goes here. The um, speaker and amplifier go here. And um, the knobs and the buttons and then some LEDs. That's really all there is to it. I made the board with Eagle. That's on my GitHub as well. I'm never going to use Eagle again because I hate their model of charging by the month. That sucks. So um, I'm, I'm using KiCad from now on, but this is from five years ago. Um, but I want to redo this board with KiCad eventually too. So as well as the board, there's a package of lots of cool parts. And there's a speaker and a battery pack that has um, other parts in it. So if you open up the battery pack, you can see the other parts. And um, um, so let's go to the next slide and show how to solder, and then I'll actually do it. So I'm going to go through these slides. To, to, so soldering actually is very easy. Um, <clears throat> if you're shown how to do one solder connection well um, by someone who knows what they're doing, then you're fine for life. A lifetime of satisfying soldering awaits all of you. So um, I'll go through not only what you do, but why. And that is what gets it solid in your brain so that you'll be soldering well for the rest of your life. Okay, I, I made a comic book with some friends, um, Jeff and Andy. Andy did the artwork and Jeff did the layout. And um, it's open source like everything I do. You can see Creative Commons. And uh, people have translated it into lots of languages to make it cool for people all over the world. And it's true in every language. Soldering is easy when you know how. Um, yeah, Soldaris and Soldaris Fasil and Lutin East Einfach. I'm trying to learn that language now. So, um, yeah, it's got a bunch of parts, and all those parts get soldered to the board. And if you put them all in the right place, and each part not only has to go in the right place, but the right, the correct orientation. Many parts, it matters which orientation you put them in. Like um, the, uh, yeah, so here is the microcontroller. You can look on the, the slide. That's the microcontroller. If you put that in backwards, it definitely won't work. Resistors go here. They uh, can go in either way. Um, but anyways, you want to put all the parts in the correct place and the correct orientation. And on this kit, all of the parts, every single one of them goes on this side of the board. If you put it on the other side of the board, this side, you know what happens? It doesn't work. So you don't want to do that. So you have to put all the parts in the right place, the right orientation, the correct side of the board, and do good solder connections. So. Um, uh, and if you do that, it will work. And it, if it doesn't, then you get to debug. <laughs> and, and it's easy to debug with a kit that's already debugged, except for the way you assembled it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about soldering. And I do not like lead-free. So that's my very, very, very strong personal preference. And I recommend everyone to not use solder without lead. 
Um, it's super critical that manufacturing uses solder without lead because that's our environment. Um, a little bit of lead with every, you know, even a teeniest little bit of lead with every unit. And there's um, um, uh, millions and millions of these units. Uh, that's a lot of lead in the environment. You do not need to ventilate well. You need to ventilate well if you use lead free. That's one of the reasons why I don't like lead free. The, the chemicals that are built into the solder, I might as well just go over this now. Here's solder, this has lead in it. It's really important you wash your hands afterwards and I'll remind you in the last slide about that too. Um, but um, uh, the fumes from this are not the metal vaporizing. The metal vaporizes at a very high temperature. A little bit, of course, is vaporizing all the time, but very, 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 very little. And um, But the fumes are from the chemical called flux that's built into most solder, in the core of solder. And the, the, the flux for lead, lead solder is usually rosin um, for electronic solder. And that's mostly sap from a pine tree plus some few other things. It's not good for you, but you know, like sitting around a campfire is also not good for you. You know, if you're sitting around a campfire with a lot of um, uh, smoke from pine, pine wood, that's worse for you than soldering. Um, so, um, you know, it's nice to have ventilation and, um, um, but if you have a room that's not totally closed, um, you should be fine. Um, the lead doesn't vaporize very well, but the fumes from the flux for lead free solder totally wug out my lungs. They make my bronchial tubes go, whoa, dude, what the hell? And they close up and it makes it hard for me to breathe. Other people don't have as much of a problem. Um, so, but anyways, like I'm not, I don't want to tell you what, what to do and not to do. I'm, I'm telling you my experience. So this is my strong personal preference. And to learn to solder without lead is definitely more difficult. Uh, lead solder flows nicely. It makes the connections more easily. It doesn't corrode the tip of the soldering iron and destroy it quickly like lead freeze does. And uh, you need a lower temperature. So you can use um, just about any soldering iron that's available. And um, yeah, it just works really, really well. And also reworking works uh, much, much, much easier with lead solder without adding lots of extra flux for reworking if you make a mistake. Um, let's see, what's the question? Lead doesn't need, uh, yeah, so uh, I don't use a mask. Uh, and I, I also, I don't use um, uh, eye protection. Um, some people do. Um, I've, I've been doing it every, you know, almost every day since I was six years old. And, um, and I've never, the worst I've done is burn myself. And if you solder, you will burn yourself. There's no question about it. Um, but um, not badly because every time you touch the soldering iron, you let go quickly. And, and I can guarantee that you will always let go quickly when you touch the soldering iron in the wrong way. So, and, it, and by the way, it does not smell like chicken. It smells terrible. So <laughs> that's another incentive to not do it. Um, yeah, burning skin or hair um, sucks. So um, um, yeah, so let me let me just continue here. I'll talk more a little bit more about solder uh, when we get to that slide. Um, the tools we need. Um, you don't want a soldering iron that's too hot, and the W is for watts. You want like 35 watts or less. 40, if you really pressed, it's okay, but uh, 40 gets pretty hot, and um, uh, but probably between like uh, eight watts and 35 is best, and 15 is kind of ideal for this kind of soldering. And there's different kind of tips on a soldering iron. So um, here, check out the tip on this one. Um, um, it looks kind of like a sharpened pencil. Um, that's called conical. They make, and again, this is, people have different preferences and my preference for this isn't so, so strong. Um, a lot of people like a chisel tip um, and that's, that's good for doing um, other kinds of soldering for me, but other people like it for all soldering. Um, but I, I strongly uh, prefer um, the, um, the conical tip. It gets to a fine point and I have more control over it. But 
you might find um, um, other ones better. Most soldering irons, when you buy them, they're conical, like a sharpened pencil. The solder, um, there's two kinds of solder with lead um, that uh, I'll recommend. 60-40 means 60% lead, tin, 40% lead, SNPB. Um, there's also 6337. And 6337 is kind of nice because it stays liquid um, um, shorter. <laughs> so, um, and there's with 6040, there's kind of an in between state, but it's not so critical. Either is fine. And I like, and rosin core is super important. You don't want solder without the flux in it. Um, and it doesn't matter what percent really for doing this kind of soldering. And I like thin solder. So 0 0.031 inches, which is 0.7 millimeters or less. And the solder that I'm using today here, um, where's, where's my, here. <laughs> this is actually 0 0.5 millimeters. Um, and I like that because you have more, you have more control, but everyone has their own preferences. So again, the, the stand, I'm just using um, this bent coat hanger and um, uh, inexpensive wire cutter and a regular kitchen sponge with regular water. Um, so to solder, we start with the first part. And then most parts, you need to bend the wires first before inserting it into the board. And wires on parts uh, in electronics, we don't call them wires when they're going to a part, we call them a lead. They lead to the part. So in a, a resistor, there are two leads. And um, I'll show you a picture of a resistor. We're gonna start with resistor one. And when you're first learning, resistors are great because they're almost impossible to hurt. Um, if you bend the leads first, if you don't bend the leads first, you can break them off while you're trying to insert them into the board. So bend the leads first. So this is what a resistor looks like. Um, and it's got different colors. Resistors also, you can't put it in wrong. Um, even if you put it on the wrong side of the board, it'll still work. There's only two leads and it doesn't matter if it's left, right, right, left, but the colored bands do matter. They matter a lot. If it's got too much resistance, then that part of our project won't get enough energy. If it has too little resistance, that part of the project has too much energy and it might damage some other parts. So it's really important to have the correct value of resistance here. Um, and uh, that's the job of the resistor is to make sure there's the correct amount of energy available at that particular place. And th that's shown by the colored bands. And sometimes colored bands are difficult to see, especially if you're one of the 10% of males who's colorblind, and then you'll have to use a meter or a friend who's not colorblind. So here's a meter. And um, you know, that's, that's too close here. Here's a meter. <laughs> and it'll, it'll show you the value if you touch it. Um, to the resistor on either side of the, either, uh, on both leads. Um, so sometimes though, depending on the manufacturer, orange looks very much like red. So do be careful when you're picking the values of your resistor. Um, in this kit, another question? Yeah. Um, so uh, in this kit, there is um, um, one 10K ohm resistor and that's brown, black, orange, brown, black, orange. And then the fourth band is always gold in these kind of resistors, brown, black, orange. And then there's three 1K resistors, which is this one. So you'll, you'll see one resistor if you, if you get the kit from me, um, one resistor, which is um, even if red and orange are similar, they'll be at least a little different. And you'll see three that are the same and one that's a little different. Um, but you should be able to get that going. So we take the first resistor and we bend the leads first. So here's about bending leads. This is a different resistor, but you get the idea. Um, just bend it at the width of the um, end of the part. So here's the left side and then do the same with the right side so that when you're done, it looked like this. Kind of like the shape of a staple. 
And then it's really easy to insert it into the board. So it has two leads. So um, there are two little areas, sort of with, uh, metal circular areas with holes in them, one for each lead. And the shape of the area is the metal areas with holes, those are called pads, landing pads for parts. Okay, and um, and they uh, these have holes in them because they're through hole parts. There's also ones where you solder directly on top of the pad. Um, you you, uh, you solder uh, to the uh, you mount the solder uh, surface mount devices SMD. That's you solder directly to the top of the pad without the hole. But it's easier to learn like this, so that's why these kits are out this way. You put the part in all the way. And um, so it's touching the board. Then you hold the part with your finger so it doesn't fall out while you bend the leads into a V. This part has two leads, so you bend the two leads into a V. If the part has three leads, bend only two of the parts into a V. If it has 12 leads, bend only two of the parts into a V, etc. Just don't want it to fall out while you solder because we're going to solder it upside down like this. And you don't want to bend these all the way down because that makes it harder to cut as the last step, which is coming up real soon. Okay, so um, here's the part in the board, and here's how to solder it. Um, first of all, how to hold a soldering iron. So you hold it with these two fingers and make sure you're holding it underneath underneath not like this because that's awkward and it's just like holding a pencil when you're writing like if i wanted to write like this it would be really weird and awkward but i like this i can aim the tip exactly where i want and have lots of super fine motor control okay so holding the soldering iron like that and of course you don't want to touch anywhere here because that's hot it's 350 degrees this kind of solder melts at 180 degrees Celsius. Okay, so um, that's how you hold it. And then I talked about the solder. There's really not much more to say about that. Um, there's three safety tips because we want soldering to be safe as well as easy and fun and useful. So safety tip number one, I already mentioned. It's hot. And every time you touch it in the wrong place, you will let go very quickly. I guarantee it. And therefore, you will not <laughs> burn yourself too badly. But if you do, look on this one here. Here is a, a wet sponge with cold water in it. So touch <laughs> your burn to the cold water and it'll heal a little quicker. But if you solder, it's just part of it. It's It sucks. And if you're a little kid, you can cry. Or if you're a big kid, you can cry. It's totally OK. And it's totally fine to solder if you're afraid and or crying. Um, yeah, so the sponge is not only for burns, it's for cleaning the tip, which I'll get to very shortly. So uh, another thing that's really important is that lead, even though it's very wonderful for a material for uh, part of the material for soldering, it is toxic and it rubs off super easily on anything it touches, including your finger. And then if it's on your finger, it rubs off super easily on yummy food that you might touch and then it gets in your body. And if it's in your body, it goes through the blood brain barrier into your brain. And if enough gets there, then you um, get really aggressive. You'll lose all your friends and no one will like you anymore. It's, uh, it's a bummer. So if you wanna keep your friends, wash your hands after soldering and before you eat or pick your nose. Um, it washes off very easily for the same reason it rubs on your fingers very easily. It rubs off very easily. So just regular warm water and soap is fine. And you don't have to be anal about it, but um, I solder all the time. So every time I finish soldering, I wash my hands twice. And, um, um, but if, you know, if you're just doing one project or whatever, but the thing is it accumulates it. You can never, ever, ever get rid of lead in your brain. That's why it accumulates and, and why you eventually get lead poisoning if you don't, if you're not careful. Okay. so. Um, so lead is not a problem unless you don't wash your hands. And washing your hands, as we all know now, is very important. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, wearing gloves is definitely not recommended. It just gets in the way uh, of your motor control. Um, and burning yourself, you know, one of the miracles of life is uh, in the form of humans and other mammals and other creatures is it's self-healing. As long as you don't do permanent damage, which is really, really, really difficult to do unless you really, really try uh, with a soldering iron, you, you won't make permanent damage. Um, I recommend not poking it into your eyeball um, or anyone else's eyeball. Um, so, but again, I don't use safety glasses. Um, stuff doesn't splatter. So, um, but if you're more comfortable wearing safety glasses, then it's totally fine. That does not get in the way of soldering. It makes it just, you know, sort of uncomfortable. We're all used to discomfort though with the mask we have to wear nowadays though. So whatever, do what you feel is good for you. So safety tip number three is the last step, which is when you cut the excess leads and that's to protect your eyes. And that's coming up soon. There's two secrets to good soldering. Uh, the first one uses the sponge and that's keeping the tip clean. And let me show you how to do that. So um, as you solder, um, little blobs of solder collect at the tip. And if enough collects there as you're soldering on the board, um, some of that solder might um, fall off and make a connection between two pads. And pads, again, are these circular, or, um, usually circular, but the metal areas that we solder to, that we connect the parts to. Um, if you have a connection between two pads that we don't want, well, it's a connection we don't want, and then our project won't work. So we wanna keep the tip clean for that. Um, and also, because the tip oxidizes, the metal from the solder won't heat up well, and then if the, if, if we, the heat doesn't flow well, we don't solder well. So for those two reasons, we need to keep the tip clean, shiny silver. Okay, so the first step, it's kind of a two-step process. The first step is to get rid of the excess solder. So look on the other one here. Let's see, where is um, uh, getting this orientation correct? It's so uh, mind-numbingly <laughs> difficult and it should be easy. Okay, so here's my soldering iron. Yeah, so here's my soldering iron. To get rid of the excess um, 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 solder, just do this three times. Tap, oh, oh, really important. See where I'm, uh, my thumb is touching here on the edge of the plastic of the handle? That's where I'm gonna tap three times, not on the metal where it'll break the soldering iron. Because if I bang it here, that'll hurt the soldering iron. But if I bang it here three times, then little blobs of solder um, hit, the, hit the desk. And those little blobs of solder on the desk are totally fine. They, they cool down in like a quarter second and you can move it away. But if, they, um, if they're on your board, they can make a connection you don't want. And that's not cool. So um, yeah, so just bang three times. And then um, you might need to hold the sponge with one finger while you press down and scrape. Rotate to the other side, press down and scrape again and some steam goes off, but then look at the tip. It's nice and shiny silver. The tip of the sharpened pencil is nice and shiny silver. And that's what you want. But if we keep looking at this tip, it's probably hard to see in this, this the, the video on my phone, um, but um, it, it's turning gray and that's oxidizing. Um, as it oxidizes, the heat won't flow well and we won't solder well. So, um, we need to clean the tip before every solder connection. And that's the first secret of good soldering. So again, the steps are first bang three times and then scrape twice, one side, then the other. And, and as people are learning, you get the hang of this. It, it, it's really quick. It's about this fast. It's, you might have to hold the sponge to keep it from sliding, but they're that fast. One, two, three, scrape, scrape. And um, um, yeah, so um, you're gonna do it a lot because there's a lot of solder connections on projects. So that's about how fast you do it. This doesn't clean the tip. You've got to push down hard and scrape. 
And you don't want to do it sideways either. Like this is the way to do it. And then turn it over and do it again. And it's nice and shiny silver ready to solder. Okay. Then um, the uh, the next secret of good soldering I'll show you as I, I come to it. Um, so uh, this is a different project, but it's the same thing. You lay your soldering iron um, over the pad. And you see, it's, the soldering iron is sort of horizontal. And the tip here is covering the top half of the pad. It doesn't matter if the top or the bottom um, or the left or the right, but it's covering half the pad and touching the lead. So we leave it there for about one second to let everything heat up nicely. And then I'm going to push solder in here. See the red dot right there. Um, right there. It's really important to do it that way um, so that the solder melts on the underside of the tip here, on the underside of the tip. Because if it melts, if I, if I, um, here, let's see, if I push solder in this way, then it melts on the side or the top of the tip where it doesn't do any good. I want to make sure that the solder melts under the tip where it will melt on the pad and make a good connection between the lead and the pad. So when I push solder in here, the solder melts because this is 350 degrees, the solder melts at 180, 185. And then we push enough solder in here um, and then pull the solder away. And the solder, all on its own, will um, flow around the pad. And it takes about a second to do that. And then we lift the soldering iron up. And then it cools down in about a quarter second, and we have a good physical and electrical connection. And I'll, I'll show more pictures to show how it works. OK, so, um, so see, I'm pushing the solder in, and I'm pushing it in so that it's going to touch on the underside of the tip and to the right, in this case, of the lead. You don't want to push it into the lead because that's not hot enough to melt the solder, but the hot soldering iron tip is. And then when you do it, it's going to be about that much solder. I'm going to push in about this much, like a millimeter or two, with really, really thin solder, maybe three. And you, if you do too much or too little, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it does matter, but it's easy to fix if there's too little or too much. And I'll show you what too little and too much looks like so you know. Um, so you push it in, and it's about this fast. And the sound effects are optional, of course. And um, so that's about how fast you do it. And again, it's about you know, one, two, three, four millimeters. If there's too little, you can add more. If there's, not, if, if there's too much, you can take some away. Um, so here's the next picture where it's actually touching. And you can see the smoke. That's the vaporizing rosin mostly sap from the pine tree going away and um and then i push in again about that much and then pull the solder away but it's really 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 important this is the second secret of good soldering keep the tip down for one second after you pull the solder away keep the tip down for one second before lifting it okay and then you should have a perfect solder connection. And a perfect solder connection is one where there's a little teeny mountain, little hill, little bump, not flat. Also, it's really important that the solder covers the entire pad. If you look down from above, let me go back here, the solder is covering the entire pad all the way around. You can't see any more of the pad because the solder is covering it. You also can't see where the hole used to be because the soldering solder is totally filled it in. OK, so if it's flat or you can see any of the pad or you can see the hole, um, there's not enough solder. So just do the whole thing again. Clean the tip, uh, put, it, put the soldering tip down. It'll melt the solder that's there and then push more solder in about the same amount and then pull away. Hold the tip down for a second. Remember, that's really important. Then you know, let the solder flow and then lift. If there's too much solder, 
That means maybe um, there's a blob of solder that connects two pads together. The way to fix that is to clean the tip and then scrape it slowly across where you don't want the solder. And then it usually sticks to the pad or to the soldering iron and pulls away. And um, yeah, and you might have to do that a couple of times. So after you solder all of the leads, in this case two, then we have to cut them short. And you do that with the wire cutter. The wire cutter, let me do this uh, with a phone. Um, uh, let's see. So you can see the wire cutter has two sides. Here's the flat side and rotate it around. And this is like deep grooves in there. So we want the flat side down. And then we want to cut with the tip of the wire cutter where we have the most control. And you do that all the way to the bottom of the, um, let me go back a, a couple slides to show you. Oh, nope, just that one slide. So we want to cut right here. It's OK to leave the little bump, but we don't want even a little bit of wire sticking up. And even if you made a mistake, it's still really important that you cut all the wires as short as possible. Um, and then, um, because if there's a little bit of wire sticking up and then the next part over has a little bit sticking up, those can bend and make a connection we don't want. And that's what we want to avoid. So cutting them short is important. But cutting involves the third and last safety tip. So um, see, I'm holding the wire. The board is on the table on my desk. I'm holding the wire cutter with one hand and the other hand I'm touching, I'm holding the wire because when I squeeze the wire cutters, it will, um, um, these uh, uh, two squeeze shut, it will actually snap shut as I cut it. And this, if I weren't holding it, will turn into a missile and go right in your eye. And the thing is they love eyeballs and they will go in your eye if you're not holding it. So. Um, if you're uncomfortable with that, you can wear safety goggles. I, I just always hold the wire when I cut it, and I'm always safe. And I do that with little kids and everything. So, okay, so that's soldering. Um, so that's the last safety tip. Always hold or cover the wire when you cut it. Um, and if the wire is too short to actually hold, like some of the parts have short leads, then you can just um, uh, cover it with your fingertip as you're cutting. And then that little bit of metal won't go flying in your eye. And they, the little ones, totally love eyeballs. So don't let that happen. Um, yeah. And then when you're done, you can see there's there's no wire coming out off the bottom. Um, do I have that for? Yeah. There's two really good solder connections with the uh, RG Touch board. So you, I recommend some people like doing a few parts at a time. I recommend though, especially if you're just beginning, doing one part at a time. Bend the leads, put the, not all parts do you need to bend the leads first, but most you do. And um, um, and then um, uh, put it in the board, bend the leads to uh, like a V so it won't fall out while you're soldering, and then solder all the leads and then cut the leads short if you need to. Not all parts do you need to cut the leads short either because they're already short enough that there's no way they can bend and make a connection you want, uh, you don't want. So, um, yeah, so you do the next part and the next part and the next part, and eventually um, you have a finished RG Touch or whatever your project is. Um, and in this case, this project, it looks like this. And uh, well, my internet seems to be a little slow at the moment, and that picture is really bad. Sorry about that. Um, it was good on the slide, but big blue button isn't perfect. So, anyways. Um, let me do the first solder connection here live. I'm going to try that anyways. Um, so um, let's see how that works. So I have my bag of parts. I'm going to grab the 10K resistor and put them all on the table. Um, so 10K resistor, here it is. Okay, so here is the resistor, and I'm going to bend the leads. So there it is. You can see it bent right. And now here is the board. 
and R1 is right there. So I'm going to put them in the two pads for R1. Then we're going to use this camera for now. And um, okay, so uh, let's see, I got to get that good. So it's on the board. I'll turn the board upside down and bend these leads out in kind of a V. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see it here better maybe? Yeah, you can see it's in a V. And I'll just put this down on the um, table. And um, let's see if, if this works. I've never done this before, so let's see if you can see what I'm doing here. Um, you know, I'll grab the uh, solder. So I've got my solder. Solder, by the way, is flexible. It's good to keep um, you know, a coil with a bunch of turns um, available so you can feed it in. But keep it coiled because you don't want it um, all over the place and accidentally melting stuff. So I've got this coil. I keep the, the coil in my palm and then hold the, um, let's see, is that, or let me do it over here. Um, See, I'm holding it here. The solder is kind of flexible. It's kind of bent. So just do this. It doesn't have to be perfect. But now if it's more or less straight, I can aim this exactly where I want to. Cool. So let's see if you can actually see me doing this here. Where's the, OK. So I'm going to solder this one right here. I don't know, can, can you actually see that? I can't really tell what you're seeing. Um, what, what do you think? If I solder this, can you actually see what I'm doing? Yeah? OK, well, let's try it and see how it goes. So first is, um, again, um, I'll take this away. And I bang, 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 and then swipe, swipe to clean the tip. It's nice and shiny silver. You know, put the board back where hopefully you can see it again. And now I lay the uh, tip down, and it's on the right side of the pad. So I'm going to push the solder in this way. And the solder goes into perpendicular, 90 degree angle, into the tip. And I'm, again, I want to make sure that it's going under the tip the solder is going to melt on the underside of the tip. Okay, so again, <clears throat> I'll clean the tip, bang, 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 swipe, swipe. It's ready to solder. It's nice and shiny silver. I'll put it down on the pad. In my case, I'm a right-hander, so I, I'm holding it with the right hand and covering the right half of the pad. I'll push solder in. And I'll pull away, keep the tip down for a second to let it flow for a second, and lift. Okay, so let's see how that turned out. That's perfect. OK, so uh, let's see. Here's the solder connection. If I go on the side, you can see there's a little bump there, teeny little mountain, teeny little hill, right? And the solder totally covers the pad. I can't see any of that goldish colored pad. I can't see where the hole used to be. So that's perfect. So now I'll do the other one. Let's see, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, so I'll do the other one. I clean the tip, bang, 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 swipe, swipe, push, solder in. Oop. Hold a second, now lift the iron, and that's another perfect solder connection. Totally covering the pad. Can't see the hole. It's a little bump if you look sort of on the side. And now it's time to cut the leads short. So I leave it on the table. I have the flat side of my wire cutter down. And I'm going to cut with the tip here. So I'll hold the lead while I cut. And just put it all the way down. You don't have to be super careful or anything. And then cut. Here's one of them. And now with the other, cut that again. And that's done. 
Cool. Yeah, so the focus is going to be a little weird. It's just a, a cheap camera. My good camera did some weird reboot thing. I don't know what's going on with it. So <laughs> that was the one I was going to use. And I was going to do it with two angles so you could see it. And it was working, looked like it was working really well uh, when I tried it earlier today. But so much, you know, mice and men and all that stuff. So um, uh, I'm not going to solder everything on this board because I already have a bunch of boards uh, soldered together. But I want to go through here in case you want to make a, a Architouch kit um, uh, to show you what's going on. So you do uh, all of the solder, uh, all the resistors, and in the assembly instructions, which are on these slides, as well as on the ones you can download from online from my website or the um, the Git the assembly instruction. Um, so put all of those in, and then it looks like this. Then comes the um, um, the microcontroller socket. So let me let me show you something important here. Here is the microcontroller. Here is the microcontroller socket. <laughs> this one has holes in it. That's the socket. I'm going to solder the socket in this one, but I'm wiggling. This. After we're done soldering everything, I'm gonna. This just pushes into the board without soldering, into the socket. The socket just is good with friction, pushing this in, and you get good connections. And the reason I'm doing this is a couple of reasons. One is, um, if you're a beginner, then it's really important that you be able to recover from a mistake. If you put this in backwards, we can recover from it. If you put the microcontroller in and solder it directly in the board. And you make a mistake, it's over. <laughs> so unless you have special tools, really, and a lot of patience. Um, so also, microcontrollers are really robust nowadays, but you know it's good not to make them too hot. So we can make this way hot. Okay. So uh, take a look at the um, the slide now. You can see with the blue circles, there's right here. There's a little notch cut into the top. Uh, the left ha uh, left edge here. It's kind of kind of small, but there's a little notch there. But here, this is just flat. And if you look on the board, there's that sort of same shape, a half circle on one side and not the other. And when you put the, um, if you look on the phone again, um, when you put the socket in, these pins sometimes are a little bit bent. So make sure, just kind of look at them Make sure they're not bent. If it's good, it should just drop right into place here without forcing it at all. Okay. It just slides right into place. Okay, and make sure the notch and the mark of the notch match both here. And I've got a slide for that too. Um, yeah, it's laid in. And now we can solder it. But to solder it, hold this with your finger, turn it upside down. This has 28 pins. It goes really fast, though, because they're all in a row. All you have to do here is um, bend the opposite corners out. Just two. That's all you need, even though there's 28. You can bend all of them if you want to, but all you need, and now it won't fall out while we solder all 28 of these. And um, I got a picture for that too. Bend the opposite corners. And then this is an exception. When all of the uh, connections are in a row, you do not need to make a, to clean the tip before every connection. And then it goes quicker. Just keep an eye on your tip. And when it starts looking not shiny silver, when it's looking dirty, then clean it. So again, I won't do that now just so we can save some time because I have working boards. But I'll show you the parts that are uh, a little bit tricky. Um, we've got next these little yellow parts, which are um, capacitors. And here's what they look like. Uh, if you, <laughs> yeah, let's see, they're kind of small. How can I, yeah. And there, we have four of these in the kit, and they're all the same. So you don't have to worry about reading the teeny little numbers printed on the side. And they're just like doing the resistors. They don't matter, it doesn't matter which way they go in. But the next are the big capacitors, and those do matter. And we've got two that say 100 UF on the side. 
C3 and C8. And we've got two that say one on the side, C6 and 7. These have long leads and short leads. But if you look this way on the part, and look over here, it's a circle. You know, on the phone video, it's a circle. And so on the board, you can see circles where they go. Um, and you can see here is C3, and here's, um, which one's that? C7, C6, etc. Um, it's C6 and 7 are both the same. You can see documentation here. Um, but it definitely matters which lead is long and which is short. So it's kind of hard to see on the board. Maybe I think the slides will show it better. So let's go back, look at the slide. Um, and, um, oh yeah, but the marking on the part, you can read that here. It says 100 UF. That's what we need for C3 and C8. And the long lead is plus. Long lead is plus for this one. That's C3. And the short lead is minus unmarked. But there's a little plus sign right here, right there. Make sure the long lead goes into that one. That's also a square pad instead of the round pad. Long lead goes in the square pad. OK. And um, same with C8. And so there's the 200. UF, and that stands for microfarad. Those are kind of big capacitors. And then C6 and 7 are one microfarad. They're the same um, um, uh, idea. The long lead goes into plus, the square pads, like this picture shows. And, um, and so we have the capacitors soldered in. And then other parts. Uh, are more obvious, but uh, the res uh, the LEDs, long and short leads, just like the capacitors, the long is plus. They go all the way into the board, just the same. You know, make them into a V and, and solder and then cut. And remember to hold leads when you cut. Um, oh, yeah, and um, save two of the leads, because we'll use those as the leads for the speaker. And I'll show you that coming up shortly. Um, yeah, so the colors don't really matter, but um, they're marked on the board, green, red, blue. This part, it's really important to do this one correctly. There's short leads. Let's see, can we see that on the video here? Kind of out of focus, let's see. So is that good? Yeah. See these short leads here, six short leads. And then here, six long leads. The short leads go in the board so that the long leads are sticking out. It's really important that the long leads stick out of the board so that our programming cable, communications programming cable, can connect to the long leads. The short leads get soldered into the board. And um, so it's, it's oriented like that. And um, oh, let me let me go back to there a bit. Uh, it's maybe a little hard to see, but you can maybe see that these uh, pads, these six pads, kind of make a zigzag pattern. So that's intended so that these um, won't fall out while you turn it upside down and solder it. If it falls out anyways while you solder it, then bend. Let's see. Where's uh, yeah? Bend two of these. Um, like I'm showing on my phone video here, bend two of them together a little bit, and that will help um, uh, stick into the pads with friction so you can turn it over and solder all six of them. And oh, I forgot to say, um, when you solder all 28 of these, you do not need to cut the leads short. There's no way those can bend over after you solder them and make a connection you don't want. Okay, so. Um, um, yeah, so I recommend not cutting them because that just gives you an uh, opportunity to mess up the board. Just leave them alone. It's totally fine. And same with these. There's no way those can bend after you solder them into the board. 
to make a connection you don't want. So no need to cut those. And that's what it looks like after that soldered in. And then um, and you can put in the switches. There's three switches, a black one and two red ones. It doesn't matter which is which. They're all exactly the same except the colors. But the way I like it is having the black one be a reset button in case you ever need to reset your synthesizer. And then the red ones for these two extra buttons here. Is there any way to undo solder um, if you do things wrong? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to show that. Um, so um, let's say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purposely try to mess things up here and show you how I recover from that. I'll make that. OK, so uh, I'm bending the leads for the um, um, for the microcontroller socket. OK, so I'm going to, again, clean the tip, bang, 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 swipe, swipe. And now I'm going to solder. And, and like I've done this all my life, so I can do it way faster and really well. But you know, all of you, even if you've never done it before, after a few solder connections, you'll be good at it. it, it you, you just get the hang of it. So watch what I do. I clean the tip, put it down. My solder, I had to bring some more out. And I'll do the next one. I'm keeping an eye on my tip, though, to make sure it's not getting oxidized. And so there's a bunch of really good solder connections. <clears throat> and there's no way to make a connection you don't want. So you don't have to cut them short, and probably best not to. Um, but now I'm going to try purposefully to do a bad solder connection. Okay, So I'll clean the tip. And now let me do just down here, like uh, in the corner here. I'm going to um, do this. Okay, so that's a bad solder connection. Let's see, can you see that? It's kind of blurry. Um, my viewing screen is just so small. I don't know if you can see that, but um, but um, the top of the pad here, there's no solder, and um, it's 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 not very smooth. I lifted the soldering iron tip up before I let the solder have a chance to flow. And this is what happens. So there's no, the solder, the, there's, the pad is not totally covered in solder. And I can see a teeny, teeny little bit of the hole on the top, on the top here. So all I need to do is act like I'm starting over from nothing on that pad. So I'll clean the tip, scrape, scrape. Now I'll put it here, melt what's there, add a little more solder, pull away, hold a second, lift. Okay? And um, that's the way you do it if there's too little solder. If there's too little solder, you definitely need to add more because otherwise there's not a connection where you want one. And if there's not a connection where you want one, of course it won't work. We want all the connections that we want and none that we don't want. Let me try making a connection we don't want now. That's a little bit harder with these, with the kits, the way I design it, but it might happen. So, especially with this thin solder, but I'm going to try to make a connection between these two and I'll put just way, 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 way too much solder in. Um, let's see what happens. I kind of have to try. It's really hard. If As long as I'm touching, there we go. I did it. Um, if you're touching only one pad when you're soldering with the solder, you're touching only one pad with your soldering iron while you're soldering, it's it's pretty hard to make a connection you don't want, but it can happen. Um, so I'll clean the tip, and you can see here, I'm going to point my soldering iron to it. Um, oop, 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 oop. Point my soldering iron to it. Um, these two pads are connected with one blob of solder. I don't know if you can see that well. Can you see that? Anybody? 
So what I'm going to do is um, I clean the tip, and I'm just going to push it down here, melt and scrape. And you can see that now it's clear. There's no more solder between them. And if you want to, you can then bang solder off, um, clean the tip, and then just touch it up a little bit. So I'll melt the solder on this one, add a little more, melt the solder on this one, add just a teeny more. That's the way you do it. <laughs> Hard to type, right? <laughs> So, um, so yeah, the, the switches just push in. You got to push kind of hard sometimes because uh, if you look on the side of the switch here, um, the leads are kind of um, kind of bent. And they'll snap into place as you push them into the board. So here's um, the reset button. Just push it in, it kind of clicks in. And then you don't have to bend the leads on those because they're already bent for you and it won't fall out while you while you solder. So again, I won't solder that now because you get the idea. Um, what else we got? And then the other buttons. Then the ceramic resonator. That tells the microcontroller exactly how fast to go. And that looks like a capacitor except it has three leads. Three leads. And um, it doesn't matter which way you put it in. Either way is totally fine. But when you do that, it's got three leads. Um, bend two of them out after you insert it in the board. And then it won't fall out while you solder it. Um, so this other part is the um, audio amplifier. Um, some of them have, like this one, doesn't have the, look on the slide, you can see here this half circle indention. Some chips have it, some don't, but all of them have this black indented dot right here. Uh, to remove solder entirely, you need some special tools. And um, um, <laughs> actually, let me, let me show you this one thing before I show you this, uh, the audio chip. Um, the audio amplifier chip. So let's say I uh, make a mistake and I actually uh, 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 accidentally um, fill this hole with solder. Okay, now I can't solder. Um, oops, let me take that out. It's not soldered. Um, which one is that? That's R5. R5 right here. R5 right here has two pads, and one of them has solder in it. And so I can't put uh, my resistor in there because the pad's um, full. So I need to remove that excess solder. So what I'm going to do, there's lots of ways to do that, and there's special tools. There's um, the easiest, the, the most common one, there's two most common ones. One is called a solder sucker or a solder pump. And um, uh, that one, um, I don't so much like using these things, but um, uh, they're good in certain things for me. But And again, this is just my preference. Um, other people have other preferences. But whatever works for you is what's good. I'm going to show you what works well for me, and that's like uh, what I call the bang on the table method. Um, so um, there's the other one, though, besides the solder pump. You, you, you push it down, it, it gets in place, and then um, it, it's kind of like a turkey baster. Um, where you, you uh, the turkey baster has that bulb, and you um, you um, push it in, and then if you let go of the bulb quickly, then the turkey baster sucks up all the turkey juice, right? So the solder sucker or solder pump has a thing where you push down the top, and it locks in place, and you push a button, which makes it the a piston go, whoop, and it sucks up anything from the tip, and. Um, that takes practice. It takes a lot of practice, actually. And um, like I said, I don't like using that for this purpose, but um, other people do. Another thing is solder wick. It's like the really, really, really teeny hairs inside of wires that are braided together, and there's um, flux on it. So if you um, melt the solder, um, 
uh, you put the braid on top of the solder, melt the solder, and then capillary action between all the hairs sucks up the excess solder. That also takes a lot of practice. And what I'm going to show you also takes practice. Soldering is easy. Unsoldering takes a lot of practice. So there's no way around that, whichever method you use. But I'll show you the method I use. So um, here, I'm going to clean the tip, make it nice and shiny. And now what I'm going to, I'll show you slow motion first. So here is the board. Um, you can't see the pad now, but I'll touch the um, uh, hot soldering tip to the pad, melting the solder on the pad so it's all liquid. And I'll hold the board like this. And um, let's say this is the table. And imagine that I'm, hold, uh, that I'm keeping the soldering iron tip here, keeping it melted. So I'll go like this and then uh, and I'm doing it, I'll do it in slow motion, but you actually have to do it rather quickly. And then I come here and, and this, and then when it hits the table, the board stops suddenly, but the momentum um, keeps, uh, uh, makes the solder keep going to hit the table. <laughs> the melted solder comes out of the hole and hits the table. And the way to do that is to keep the soldering iron there. I'll do this in slow motion. So I'll go down, 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 down. At the last moment, I stop uh, moving the soldering iron with the board and then hit the table. So I want to keep the soldering iron keep uh, on the pad, keeping the solder melted until the last moment, in which case uh, at which point I stop moving the solder iron, but keep moving the board quickly and hit the table. And that keeps the solder melted long enough so that when it hits the table, it's still melted metal and hits the table and it's gone. So here, I'll do this underneath the camera so you can see it happen in real time. Kind of melted. And, and then here is the solder that used to be in the hole. And there is the clear hole. I don't know if you could see that OK, but that's the idea. And it does take practice. And I can make that look easy. I can also make soldering look easy because it is. But that isn't easy. It takes practice. So if you solder enough, though, you will make mistakes. And you will need to fix them. And you will gain practice. And along the way, you will burn yourself. And you will burn up parts, and you will destroy boards. <laughs> and there's no way around that. Um, I tried to my best to design this board to make it as easy as possible and to make it rework very easily. It's a high quality board, so you can rework parts without destroying the board many, many times. Um, so if you, if anyone does this board and um, uh, makes a mistake, um, if you, if it's not working when you're done. Uh, or you need help, email me, and you can email me high definition, uh, high resolution, in focus photos of the top and the bottom of the board, and I can tell you if anything's wrong and help you uh, debug it um, if you can't do that on your own um, or don't want to do it on your own. Okay, so um, yeah, so back to the uh, audio amplifier chip. Here's the uh, chip. This one doesn't have the um, half circle, but it does have the, um, the black dot indented in the corner. And so when you put that in the board, that black dot is pin one. And you can see pin one marked on the board, that one right above my fingernail, wiggling fingernail. So I want to put the black dot here, here. OK, so that goes in without a socket. And just put it in and then bend, bend at least two of the leads out so it won't fall out while you solder it. And then, um, oh yeah, and one thing, these leads, they're, um, where is that, there. The leads are kind of like this when they're new. You want to bend them in like this so they'll fit in the holes. And if they're bent right, you don't have to force it in. You don't want the pins to like bend under where they won't be able to get soldered. That's one caveat there. But it's it's really easy. So here's um, me bending them. You can do it on the table or just use your fingers. Now they're parallel. 
and I'll um, put it in the holes and um, now it's in there. I can bend two of the corners out just like I did with the bigger microcontroller chip and it's ready to solder. Okay, but again, I won't do that because you get the idea now. Um, what's next? Yeah, bending the leads. <clears throat> Here I did it on the table rather than with my fingers. The big chip, though, if, if the, any of the, the, um, um, the microcontroller socket, if any of those um, are uh, not straight, be sure to be really careful of that because you don't want any of those leads to bend under where you can't solder them as well. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, that's just more on that chip. I already went over that. My internet seems to be a little bit slow, so um, oh, that picture is not so good, but it's better on the slides that you download. Um, yeah, so um, U2 is now soldered. Uh, that's the, the chip. We can put the... Um, um, that's a volume control for the um, for the audio amplifier. That doesn't that doesn't affect at all the output from the audio output jack. That audio output jack is not a headphone jack. If you have earbuds, you'll you'll be able to hear what's coming out, and it is stereo. Um, but this volume control doesn't affect the volume of that. Um, it only affects the volume coming out of the speaker. And it's set to be halfway in its rotation. Leave it there. That's the perfect place for it. Um, you might have to bend these leads out a bit to solder it in. This won't push down all the way. Just push down until it's in place, uh, slides in and stops. Solder all three of those. Um, then the headphone jack only fits in one way, the audio output jack, rather. Um, looks like a headphone jack. And um, that you'll need to rest the board on the headphone, uh, the audio output jack on the table and solder it. Um, and some of those pads are pretty big. So um, make sure you use enough solder to totally cover the pads when you uh, solder that one in. You'll use a bunch of solder, but that's cool. It's worth it. And then it's time to push the um, microcontroller in. And when you do that, again, the, um, the leads, when they're brand new, are not necessarily um, parallel. <laughs> you need to um, make sure they're parallel. Don't do these with your fingers. Do that on the tabletop. Otherwise, they'll, they'll all be not even. You want them to do it on the table where they all come in together at the same angles and make them parallel. And you have to be careful um, when you push it into the socket that it's in the correct way. Um, the half circle is on all of these chips always. And make sure it matches the little notch on the um, socket and the marking that you can no longer see underneath it. If you put the socket in accidentally backwards, it doesn't matter. Um, but you want to make sure that the half circle mark here is on this side, <laughs> so uh, where the marking on the board is. Okay, then you push it in. And when you push this in, it's best. Uh, uh, the photo here, I was trying to take a picture holding the camera with one hand and um, uh, holding uh, the chip with the other. Um, and that didn't work so well because I only have two hands, a basic human limitation. But when you do it, it's best to do it with two thumbs, like on my phone video right here, and then push down, and it just slides into place, which is kind of nice. OK, so um, uh, do that now. And yeah, make sure all the pins are nice and straight before you do it because you do have to kind of force it when you push with your thumbs um, and if they're not lined up with every pin in the hole in the socket kind of look on the side and make sure they're all cool 
um, one of the pins might bend under and it's hard to see after the chip's already in. If it is, then you can take a small screwdriver and wiggle it out and then straighten the pin very carefully. If you have a small needle nose players, that helps. If not, you can try to carefully use your wire cutters without cutting <laughs> to straighten the pin. Um, it's important to uh, not do that though, because these pins after they bend the wrong way are kind of fragile. So do be careful with that. Yeah, then the, uh, the controls potentiometers are called variable resistors is what they are. They only fit in one way and they have three leads. So bend, uh, bend all three out and then they won't fall out. They won't fall out while you uh, solder that upside down on the board. Um, they only fit in one. Okay, so then the speakers, this is uh, a little bit weird. So um, I'll do, uh, I'll show you one of the leads, but let me, let me show you the pictures first. So we saved leads from um, the LED, uh, two of the leads from the LEDs earlier. Um, here they are. And LED ones are the best because they're stiff. They're stiffer than the other parts. Um, so what we want to do is solder this into here or this into here, or both. So not in the, uh, the tab with a hole in it. What we want to do is melt right here. It has a solder blob there already. We're going to melt that and then push this into it. And then melt this and push this into it. And now the speaker will have two leads. Because right now, the speaker does not have any leads. Here's, this speaker looks a little different than that one, but it's the same idea. And you, know, you can see um, here's the tab with the holes, and here's the tab with the hole here. But just in from there is this solder blob. We're going to melt that and then push, push a lead into the melted blob. <laughs> And you have to do that kind of quickly because otherwise, if you're holding this piece of metal with your finger while this is hot enough to melt the solder, then this will heat up and you won't like it. <laughs> so, um, but let me let me do that. Um, I will um, add two leads. See which one. That one's short. Okay. There we go. Um, cool. So here are two leads, and I'm going to put them into the solder blobs here so that um, we have two leads on our speakers. So clean the tip. It's best to um, uh, add a little bit more solder to these solder blobs first. So I'll do that. There's that one. And now this one. Just a little bit of solder just to get the solder um, malleable and <laughs> ready for pushing some lead into it. Okay, so that's ready. Now, get this ready. I'm going to push that in there after I melt it. So I'll melt this blob and I'll push this in. Hold till the solder cools, which takes a little bit because there's a bunch of metal there. Okay, now you can see the lead is sticking out. Kind of cool. Um, I'll do that with this other one. Get this ready with my fingers. If you like, you can use the small needle nose players too, but melt that. Okay, melted. There we go. Oh, missed it. <laughs> there we go. Hold it till it cools. And now I've got two leads. And the spacing of those two solder blobs is just perfect for sticking into the spacing 
um, where's the speaker here, between these two pads for the speaker. So you can um, put that in um, to the, the two and then, um, and then you can do it any way you like. I have it so that uh, the speaker, when it's done, it's kind of like this. But if you like, you can have it sticking up, you can have it sticking the other way around. Another thing I've done also is to have it so that it's facing down when I'm done. And then I can, I made a cardboard box with a hole. So it has more base, uh, kind of a, a base resonator. Like any, any good speaker is a box and not just a speaker out in the air because the box lets the low frequency uh, wavelengths resonate in the box. So you get better bass that way. Um, so some ideas. Um, and then there's really just one more thing left um, after you do the speakers, speaker leads. Um, and that's the power supply. So, um, and there is one kind of mess up on my part. Um, so these leads um, from the um, from the battery pack, there's a red lead and a black lead, um, red lead and a black lead. Um, the idea is to look on the slide again. Um, there's two holes in the board where you can push the black lead and the red lead up and then it curves around and then the um, black wire solders into this pad and the red curves around and down and then um, solders into the one marked red. The unfortunate thing is I measured the holes here and this is for strain relief so that as you wiggle this around in your project, um, if you don't have that strain relief, the solder connection, uh, the wires will just bend back and forth and break in that solder connection. But with this, they're very solid. You, you can you can do lots of abuse and it still works. So unfortunately, I measured these holes with a different um, um, uh, diameter of plastic coating for these leads. So on some of the kits, those holes um, um, are a little bit too small for these wires to fit through, like this board. I can't, I can't push the black wire through there. So the thing to do, one of the things you can do anyways, um, and it's really good to have that strain relief, is take your wire cutter and then wiggle the point back and forth a bunch to widen the hole in the top and then the bottom. And you don't have to do much. And then the uh, then it does push through. Where's the hole here? Now I can push the that through and then this loops back around and then can go into the pad. Yep, they're a little bit messy now. Okay, so that's um, looped around, ready to solder, and I'll solder it on the underside. And then you can um, pull this, and then it's got really good strain relief. Uh, with that and the solder connection, you're totally set. So same with the red wire. Um, but again, I won't do that right now. Um, and um, yeah, then you put batteries in and turn the batteries, uh, the power supply on. Oh, the, this has a, um, a switch on off switch. Make sure that it's off when you put the batteries in. In case something's wrong, then you can turn it on. If it doesn't work, you can turn it off and then try to see what's wrong. But if you turn it on, you will uh, be able to make really cool sounds and it'll sound like this. Ooh. Yeah, I got all of them going. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it'll sound like this. And 
you can make music and noise and sound and then you can reprogram it and do the other synthesizers and all sorts of things. So, um, uh, so once you, once it works, you can reprogram it and I'll show you how to do that now. Um, let's see. Oh, why not hold leads with small players? You can do that. You can definitely do that. Um, uh, but if you don't have small players, then you use your fingers. And if you burn yourself, you burn yourself. <laughs> it's part of soldering. <laughs> um, I've burned myself way more times than I can possibly count, but I've got calluses on all my fingers now. So, um, but yeah, it's totally, totally, totally fine to use uh, small needle nose players. Um, and I, I have those too. I just wanted to show you how to do it without it. So thank you for asking about that. Um, yeah, so let me show you how to uh, program, reprogram this. It's already pre-programmed with the one I was just playing. Instructions for how to use these come. <clears throat> there, there's uh, PDFs. There's also at the beginning of every um, sketch are instructions as well. So um, I don't have time to go over all the different cool things that all of these synthesizers can do, but they can do a lot of really cool things with a lot of presets and stuff. But let me just show you how to reprogram it now. Um, um, so you'll need the Arduino software. And um, do I have slides for that? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, so you'll also need a um, FTDI. It's called an FTDI cable because FTDI was the first company that made it. Here's an FTDI cable. Right side of this plastic is a USB serial converter chip. And then on this side are six colored wires into a connector for six pins. And um, here is a board. And it's got this six pin connector with a long lead sticking out. And they're labeled here um, uh, BL, BLK and GRN. I'll show pictures of it as well. So these original, with the original cable, there's black wire here and green here. So BLK and GRN, black and green. So just make sure you connect that the correct way. And then this goes into your USB um, and, um, and you're set. So you need to install a driver. If you don't have Linux, this works for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. If you don't have Linux, you'll need to install a driver for Windows or Mac OS. Um, um, and I'll show you the links for that. But um, here's a very inexpensive one, the one I sell on my website. Um, these red boards um, are really, really cheap in China, but they don't have the correct um, pinout for Arduino projects. So me and my friend Tully made this green board to convert it <laughs> and make it all work. And that's way, 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 way cheaper than the original FTDI. But since there's no colored wires, we just marked, <laughs> you know, let me go to the phone. Um, we marked the names, the, <laughs> the words for the colors here. <laughs> and then um, there's a, a cable. I can't find my cable. Here it is. So you put the cable on. Cable on. Do that with the phone. Yeah, put the cable on. And then the other end of the cable has six holes, which fit into the synthesizer, the RG Touch. Um, let me get rid of this so I don't burn myself in this process. Okay. And um, yeah, so let me show you uh, how to set up Arduino if you've never done that. and. Uh, install the drivers and do the two things you need to do to set it up the first time and then you're set. So um, so first download the software uh, arduino.cc and download the one for your operating system and 
then you double click it and it installs and it works. Mac OS, you might have to do that twice because it's Mac OS. Um, Windows and Linux, it's super easy. Uh, Max, it's, it's also almost always it works the first time, but sometimes you have to just do it twice and it's still super easy. Um, and then you've got to um, uh, download and install the ArduTouch library, Arduino library, which is on my website or the GitHub. And that is here. Um, I'll show you that on my on my website too. Um, I have schematics, I have the board layout, everything is on my GitHub, everything. Um, so, and I'll, I'll give you the link for that as well. Um, it's also, most of the stuff is on my um, projects page on Cornfield Electronics as well. And um, yeah, you also need to install the drivers. <clears throat> I'll show you um, a link to that as well. So you, you download <clears throat> the ArduTouch Arduino library. And after you've installed the Arduino software, there will be a library folder. So put, put the ArduTouch library in there. The links are in the shared notes. Thank you, Zap. And um, so, um, yeah, and then download the sketches that you want to program. You can do one or many, whatever, one at a time, of course. And um, there's sketches. And the um, if you use mine, um, here's the link. But that's on my website as well. And uh, I'll show you my website after this. And um, you know, got to have the right one from Win for Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Linux almost always has the driver built in. Um, and a driver, for people who aren't uh, familiar with those, that's uh, what all operating systems need to control any hardware of the computer. Uh, the keyboard, the mouse, the screen, those are built in, so the operating system has that already. But for something like this, um, um, the operating system um, Windows and, and Mac anyways don't know about this. So you have to install the driver separately. And when you do, the operating system knows how to use it because of the driver. <clears throat> so what, what your operating system will see when, when you install the driver and then plug this in to this uh, USB is a serial port. And a serial port is what computers all used to have to get stuff in and out of computers, and they're still useful. And uh, the operating system automatically gives the serial port a name. If it's Linux, it'll be USB TTY0. If it's Windows, it'll be COM and then some number between 0 and 31. And if it's Mac OS, it'll be USB serial and then a whole bunch of weird numbers and letters. <laughs> And that'll be important when I show you about the Arduino software. So you install the Arduino software, double click it, and it just works. And then you can fire it up um, with the Arduino software already there. You don't want to put the Arduino library uh, in the library folder when, you're, um, when the software is running. So do that first. And then you've got to do two things, two things the first time you use the Arduino software. Um, and you, you have to do those things if you change your cable or board. But um, as long as you're using just the Arduino board and your same serial cable, you're, you don't have to do these settings. But just two things, and it's easy. So first of all, you've got to tell it which board. And the Ar Arduino Touch looks like an Arduino Uno. So you go to the Tools menu, and then Board. And these are all the boards the Arduino Corporation made. And you click on Uno. And when you do that, then you'll see uh, here it says Arduino Uno. And the Arduino Touch board looks like an Arduino Uno. And then next, you got to tell it the name of the serial port. So here's an example with Windows. Um, you go to Tools again, and then Port and then com, and then a number. Um, usually, you'll just see one. If you have Mac OS, you'll see a bunch of choices. But the only one that's good, if your driver is installed well and your cable's put in there, you'll see USB serial or USB TTY 
and then the other numbers and letters. Linux is always USB TTY zero, unless you have several cables, which we probably don't. Then we'll be labeled zero, one, two, three, etc. Okay, so you just choose that and then it's done. And then down here, it'll say Arduino Uno with the name of the serial port and then it's ready. Um, all you need to do is connect the cable up well and um, fire up the um, software with the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, open the sketch you want. Here is our Apology. That's uh, the one with the arpeggios with the Bach-like modulations. Um, and, um, and then click this button right here, which is called Upload. And I'm actually going to do this uh, with a screen share so you'll get to see it happen. Um, yeah, just click that button. It's, and it says Upload right here when you do that. And then you'll see a bunch of stuff happening down here. It'll say compiling, you'll see a progress bar, and there'll be a bunch of information in this black bar here go by. And um, after a few seconds, it'll be ready. And it'll say upload done. And then you have a new synthesizer in your Art Touch board. And then you can make some new noise. <laughs> OK, so let me actually do this. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'll share everything. You'll see an infinite uh, <laughs> feedback loop for video. There it is, the infinite feedback with video. Yay. OK, so um, uh, where's my, here's our apology. Can you all see that? Is that? Yeah, you can. I can see on my phone. OK, good. Um, so let me um, connect up. Um, I'll, I'll use the FTDI one. It's exactly the same either way. Um, plug this in. And right now this has uh, Dronetics in it, that drone, which is really nice. But um, yeah, so this is, um, this is what's in it now. That's what's in it now. Let's let's turn it into our apology, the one with the arpeggios. So um, I've got um, the. Uh, doesn't matter if you're using this one or this one. Just got to be sure you hook it up the correct way. Green to green, black to black. Okay. And it's, it's being powered now by my um, USB power. Um, make sure the battery is off when you're doing that. You don't want the computer and the batteries to fight with each other. Um, but now I'll um, just click. Can you see that? Yeah. So see, when I, when I go over this, it turns white. And then over here, it says Upload. OK, so I'll click that. And this takes a little while. My computer, for some reason, the Java is kind of funky right now. I'm not sure what's going on. So it takes a little longer. It usually just takes like a second or two. But anyways, now it's compiling. That means it's converting all the text on the, on the screen into a form the microcontroller understands. And once it finishes compiling, um, then it'll start uploading, meaning it sends that data to the microcontroller's memory where it's a program that will run and it'll start running immediately when it's done uploading. So um, right now it's still compiling, compiling the sketch. Arduino, they changed the name of program to sketch. You know. Oh, an error occurred. Let's see what happened. Um, three, do I have the wrong board? Let's see, Arduino Uno. Port, ah, that's not, I don't have COM3 now. I've got um, COM4. So um, let's try it again. And down here, 
it says what the settings are. Arduino Uno, the lower right. Arduino Uno with COM4. So let's try that again. It's going to have to compile it again, unfortunately. That's just part of Arduino. But the Arduino people, uh, they change a lot of the words so that it's more friendly to non-geeky people. So these aren't programs anymore. They're sketches. And, um, and the programming language is not C++, which is what it is, but they call it wiring. Um, <laughs> compiling, it still says compiling. That's kind of a weird word. Um, uploading is still uploading. Loops are still loops, but whatever. So uh, it's compiling. It should be done momentarily. Linking. And now it should upload. Now it's uploading. And the, the drone is gone. Now it's uploading the new sketch in it. First, it writes all the data to memory. Then it reads it back to be sure that it's correct. And if there's no mismatch, then it just says, thank you. And then uh, done uploading. There it is. Thank you. So now we have um, now we have our uh, our apology. And it'll do the Bach-like modulations with uh, uh, with a, a random number generator, so it never repeats. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, it's cool stuff. So yeah, uh, the the cables separate because a lot of people have their own, and hackerspaces all have them. You can use for free. So I just want it to be as accessible as possible. And um, um, so um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> any, any other questions? Welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Triads. It's, uh, yeah, I, I love Bach, and so does Bill, and so. Um, and also Eno is one of my heroes. So this is, this one's very Eno and uh, Eno-like and Bach-like. <laughs> oh, and let me let me just play a few seconds of this other. Uh, you know, turn that down, and uh, uh, here it is. So. Um, you know, I got all these, um, um, <laughs> oh, big blue button, where'd you go? Okay, yeah, so let me stop screen sharing. Um, and now I'll, I'll just upload this uh, YouTube video, which is um, me playing all seven of them, uh, sort of jamming with myself. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I like dark. As well as like beautiful and uh, noisy, this is sort of a dark jam. Yeah, anyways, you get the idea. So, <laughs> and uh, you can do lots of cool stuff with these. Um, so if you do any uh, of your own um, synthesizers, please let me know and I'll share them with other people. Um, you know, anything at all, at all cool, um, it's worth sharing. So, um, um, and if you need help, like I said, just let me know. So cool, thanks everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks for being part of Hope. Uh, I'm glad we could be together in this virtual way, even if we can't be together in, in reality. Um, but this allows a lot of people who can't come to Hope to come too. So um, yeah, share the joy with others and, and uh, yeah, have a good one. Close recording.